So, player motivation. Let's just go directly to the next slide. Because, as Berge was talking about, it's about having one end being about competition and the other end being about collaboration. It's often a bit hard to distinguish when a game is directly competitive or when it's collaborative. The most direct way to make a game com competitive is, as Berge mentioned, say that if you do something specific, you win the game. With the example being very well from the family Anderson, that the person who gets to inherit the house wins the lot. You could even take it to a, a further extreme of the failure and say that the person who inherits the house in the LARP also inherits the, LARP, uh, the house for real. Then you make some actual stakes and you make it even more extreme that this LARP actually becomes really competitive because you get really, really motivated because you want the house. Except if you don't want the house, but yeah. Uh, this is what we also often refer to as playing to win. This is very normal for a lot of board games as well, that you often have very clear goals on how to achieve victory over the rest of the players, or you can team up in groups and then your group can win the game or win the LARP. And uh, then we have the other end of, this, of the fader, which is collaboration. And uh, that's often a little bit more complex, but it's about working together to achieving a more uh, interesting story or somehow achieving something that you agree on would be best for the game. Uh, a, more, a more easy example could be if we compare with uh, Family Anderson again. Let's say that we all agree that Bjarke should get the inheritance. That's how the game should end. Then we all have to play towards Bjarke's character getting the inheritance. We sort of agree on this beforehand, so no matter what happens, this is what we all try to achieve. So we all work together to create an interesting story where Bjarke's character ends up getting the whole inheritance. This is a collaborative way of playing where it's not about winners or losers in the same way, it's more about agreeing on some kind of uh, common goal that we all try to achieve. For example, Bjarke getting the inheritance. Some would say that Bjarke is still winning because he's getting the inheritance, but we all agreed that this was the goal, so in a way we're all winning. Um, but this is often what we call playing to lose, because often when we use collaboration, not always, but often it is about achieving some very horrific, it's exploring family trauma, it's about, let's say that we are playing the family Anderson and we should all agree that the Tintin character, which Bjarke is playing, the one in the wheelchair, should suffer as much as possible. Then Bjarke's character, Tintin, is really losing the game and we are exploring how mean we can be and we can really explore how bullying works out. So we achieve something different than somebody winning, but it's, it's still a bit more complex than just saying we should get the inheritance and the one gets it wins. So I'm going to talk about my first experience with collaborative rules, which is a pirate LARP. And the rules was like this. The first one was, have mercy, I'm just a lowly pirate. The thing that this rule meant was that every time I say this, you are not allowed to kill me. Because I'm so, I'm so lowly, I'm just, I'm just a pirate, how could you kill me? And then you're instantly not allowed to kill that character. That's a more collaborative way because you can't just win the game by killing that person. We all agree that if I plea for mercy, you have to follow up on this. That's a collaborative way of thinking that we work towards some kind of rules that helps further the story where my pirate character survives. The second and very, very hilarious rule was that was just a cat. So this rule implies that if something really odd happens, maybe let's say someone would be trying to go and sneak out of the room 
a lot of people would be noticing that, like Pjarke trying to go all the way up to the room, and then I would be looking at you and like, oh, that was just a cat. And then everybody has to ignore Pjarke. He just ceases to exist, and the game becomes about what I'm then going to say. So I say, that was just a cat. We ignore Bjarke, and I begin talking about something else that is important. Maybe that I'm a lowly pirate, or maybe I want to shoot you. So then we sort of narrate the game as players by using this collaborative rule set. And also there was the incognito rule, which is a bit the same thing. Whereas whenever you try to make a disguise, no matter how ugly it is, it always works. So if I put on a wig, I'm a woman. If I put on a dress, or just part of a dress, I'm a woman. Or at least that's how you need to see me. Uh, and vice versa. Or if I'm uh, taking another hat on. Let's say I take my hat off and I'm like, oh, I'm not Charles anymore. And you would have to believe that. Because I had clearly changed my disguise. Now I'm Charles again. But even though this game was still about winning, and that's where it sometimes becomes confusing, because this was actually the game also that had the most clear set for how to win. The team with the most gold won the game. And that's where this failure talks become complicated, because was this game a collaborative game or a competitive game? I have no good answer, but that's definitely something to think about. It was definitely not on a max end of the scale. Even though it was, had a clear win state, it still had a lot of collaborative rules. So, competitive games. It's often about feeling cool, being the best. You get this, you get this really motivation about being awesome because I got, I want the inheritance or I won uh, the million dollars in the Jeopardy game, or I achieved greatness. And what really helps making this motivation real is that goals are often very clear. You win when you get the inheritance. Rules are clear, so it's easy to motivate you. I need to get the inheritance. Best costume. That's where sometimes the competition becomes out of game. Sometimes I'm feeling, I'm going to this LARP, I have the coolest costume, and that becomes really important. There are some games where player culture is all about the coolest costume, and that's a competitive environment. What motivates the players to go to such a LARP is having the coolest costume. And you can design for this in different ways. It could be about getting the coolest gear. I mean, look at that sword, isn't that awesome? I want to have that sword, and I also want to have that body, but that's another thing. A <laughs> lot harder to achieve. Um, being victorious, again, as I said before, it's, ah, it feels really good. Yeah, it feels great. And uh, now the only thing we need is an 80s montage. Like, do, 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 oh yeah, okay, but next slide. So, I have this really uh, good picture for how to uh, how to see collaborative gaming as the other end of the scale. I've uh, been uh, rowing when I was younger, and one thing that you learn from rowing is that if you don't work together, you get nowhere. If I start rowing really, really fast, and some of the other people in the boat are not rowing, we get nowhere. If someone is rowing a lot on the one side, and someone is rowing a lot on the other side, we just float around in a circle. We don't get anywhere. One person cannot get the boat somewhere, no matter how hard they try. So to really achieve greatness, and some of the really, really amazing stuff, we have to work together. Obviously, it's also a lot more complex to make these collaborative games. Um, but if you really want to achieve some really, really amazing stuff, it's the way to go, at least. That's my biased opinion for making really big LARPs. So, to sum it up, competitive games. It has clear motivation. The clear motivation comes because the goal is really understandable. 
it's really easy to get that I want to get the money or I want to be the king or the queen or I want to uh, win the beauty contest, whatever it could be. Uh, which also makes it easy to play because you understand what you need to do. But one of the dark sides of having a very competitive environment is the same as with in real life competitive, competitive environments, that you get disagreements. There can be disagreements about the rules, there can be disagreements about people or um, someone is having an unfair advantage because they're white and male. And uh, there can be a lot of reasons for, for arguing against that something is unfair and that can, that can, make, that can make a lot, of, uh, a lot of problems among the players. Um, and lastly, there's risk being all about winning. I'm not sure what I meant there, but there's clear risk that there's only one winner often and that makes it hard for those who don't win. But yeah, to the other end of the fader. So in the bottom, there's more focus on the stories than the ego. So you can often achieve something by working together by, for example, as we did with, let's say, Bjarke was playing Tintin Tin in, the, in the Family Anson game by focusing on what should we do with Bjarke's character, what, what story would be most interesting, we can really achieve something. Whereas uh, it's not anymore about Bjarke, it's about Bjarke's character and how can we really build something with it. Whereas if it wasn't about winning the game, it would be more about if I'm the winner or Bjarke is the winner. Um, we also achieve, or at least try to achieve, an equal payout. So there's, in a sense, no losers, even though we're playing to lose, which might sound a bit strange, but that's often how it works. That by all trying to give good experiences to each other, we all get a nice payout from the games. Um, but it's a lot more complex often. It's uh, traditionally harder to make. It's harder to achieve um, because you don't have the really clear sets, at least I think it's really hard. Um, but yeah, most LARPs, as with the other fader, is a mix. Sometimes you have uh, competition, sometimes you have collaboration. The Family Anderson game, nobody, nobody said that you would win if you got the inheritance. So you could argue that it wasn't a really a competitive game, but it was still about characters achieving something. So it becomes still very competitive. And like the pirate game I was at, where there was an actual winning state, even though all the rules was there to enforce another kind of play. So my final points being, one thing that is really important is that players easily take control of the style. If there is a specific culture, if you are playing a specific country, they have a culture where they really like to do it in a competitive way or in a collaborative way and everything becomes very centered about how they do it. And there you can choose to either be very strict and very enforcing on your play style or your, if it should be competitive or collaborative, um, or you can be more adaptable. And that's again up to you as a, as a game master and a game designer, how are you going to approach these, um, these out of control scenarios that you're going to me down the road. Um, yeah, and the players will always find a way to compete or they will always find a way to work together. No matter how, what kind of design you make, they will always find a way to break it. Um, which is often why all, all games that you make, even though you really want to have a clear goal of winning, well, there's always going to be someone who doesn't care about the winnings and they're going to try to lose. Maybe they don't want to inherit the house for real after the game because they don't want to move to Ruta. And then the incentive of winning the house disappears, at least in some sense. And then traditionally, as I always said already, collaborative games hard to pull off as an organizer. That's my experience. So thank you very much. That was all for me.